To, to answer your question, criminals are rational actors. Um, you know, you, you look at the studies on this uh, and the way in which criminals operate. Um, obviously, they don't want to confront someone with a firearm any more than you know, we would want to if we were criminals. They are rational actors. Um, you, you know, you, you mentioned the statistics, statistics on defensive gun uses. Um, I think that is important to point out. Um, I would also note you know, how much lower that it is, considering there are a number of states that essentially do not allow ordinary law-abiding citizens to protect themselves with firearms in public and or to make it um, far more difficult uh, for individuals to keep and bear arms even inside their own homes. Um, and so that could be considerably higher under different circumstances. Um, you know, that, that said, again, I, I appreciate you pointing that out. Uh, but again, criminals are rational actors to pretend otherwise is, is borderline silly. Um, so of course- I'm a gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Buffalo, Uvalde, Sandy Hook, Tree of Life, Mother Emanuel Church, El Paso, Walmart, Pulse Nightclub, Las Vegas, Columbine, the bloodbath continues. In the history of our species, a number of civilizations have practiced or allowed human sacrifice, including the sacrifice of children. The Carthaginians, the Mesopotamians, the Incas, the Aztecs. Will we be recorded as such a society that accepts the sacrifice of innocence? Gun violence is the number one cause of death of children in the United States of America today, which makes us globally unique. The rates of gun violence and gun death are 20 times higher than other industrialized nations like France, the United Kingdom, Israel, Norway, Sweden, Japan. No other nation comes close to what we see here, even though we have comparable levels of mental health problems and mental illness. Will we continue to accept the slaughter of innocents, including innocent children, so as an acceptable collateral him, damage for loyalty to a completely a, bogus and distorted misreading of the Second Amendment and what the Supreme Court um, has said about it? Justice Scalia in the Heller decision was emphatic that reasonable gun safety regulation is perfectly consistent with the Second Amendment rights. Justice Scalia said he specifically rejected the view advanced by a number of our colleagues today, look how many saying that the right of gun ownership is, is not unlimited. No, Justice Scalia stated the Second Amendment right is, quote, 
when not the right to no keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in watches. any manner whatsoever we're watching and for whatever it because purpose. we're obligated to understand what they're attempting to do the, so we can challenge it but aside from us who have to pay attention of reasonable regulations including a ban on carrying concealed weapons the possession of firearms by felons the mentally ill and other dangerous people laws forbidding the carrying of firearms into schools and government buildings and other public places laws imposing the conditions and qualifications on the sale of firearms such as background checks all all of these things he said are perfectly consistent with the second amendment right it's not different from other rights we have like the first amendment so this guy has got where you this have an absolute right to speak you don't have a ads. right to set up so is this guy not even using a computer? system in front of the White House at two o'clock in the morning and keep the president's family up. This we accept reasonable time, place, manner, regulations with respect to all rights. Now, our colleagues invite us to believe the Second Amendment is some kind of policy straitjacket, but they won't read or quote the decision <laughs> by Justice Scalia himself, who wrote the most elaborate defense and explication of the majority's view of the Second Amendment in D.C. versus Heller in 2008. Mr. Suplina, in 2005, Congress gave the gun industry unprecedented and unique immunity from civil lawsuits for crimes committed with their products. No other industry's got anything like that. Could you explain what that immunity protection means for the gun industry and how it is sure. blocked Which common sense in California to end gun in violence. the 1990s they yes, suggested that you. guns uh, are responsible for the acts of criminals or negligence and they sue a company has given for many, many millions, millions of dollars more than they possess which uh, turned into a lawsuit against Glock which was defended as well as and, and that's when the government said instead of allowing us to continue wasting everybody's time and money and tying up the courts they created a muzzle on the petty lawsuits that were suggesting that the presence of a firearm in society is somehow responsible for the violence what reckless marketing and sales practices is the gun industry engaged in because of this blanket of immunity that has been bestowed upon them well, you know, the, there are several, uh, and the marketing is getting increasingly reckless, uh, incre increasingly desperate as the field gets more crowded, uh, but also in terms of distribution practices. I've heard several times today about how easy it is for criminals to get guns as if that's some act of magic, but these guns are all starting with gun manufacturers and gun sellers. Um, we, are, we know that certain gun manufacturers are fueling gun shops that are selling disproportionately into illegal markets. And the gun industry is is protected by PLACA because they say, oh, we're following the law. Well, the numbers speak for themselves. Okay, so, and then finally, um, Chief, um, you were so interrupted. So we suggest before. that there's a manufacturer that sells to that specific gun shops that traffic example, to the criminal, uh, criminal class. Criminals don't so why don't the they just, why do they allude to that? Why don't they offer some murder, indication rape, and solve assault, this crime so that it will stop the flow of guns? Gentleman's time has expired, but the gentleman may answer. So the universal oh, okay, I've got the headset on the other side of the screen. Those so that want to legally obtain their guns with their constitutional rights to obtain those guns, criminals absolutely are not going to follow that. But the more guns that we keep flooding in without background checks, without uh, proper uh, uh, adherence to get those guns uh, through straw purchases and other manners, that's how we're flooding the market so that the criminals can obtain those guns. And Justice Scalia emphasized that Jim, Jim, the regulations time has expired. Sale. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon, is now recognized. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, we hold uh, hearings on all sorts of topics for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes for political reasons, or even worse, sometimes for political theater aimed at attaining political currency, currency which will then be spent on winning Look at how many election. people are in this. Other room. times, hearings are held to actually solve this the is farce. We're here theater. today because of the tragedies in Buffalo and the horrific loss of life in my home state of Texas, of Uvalde, the beautiful American community ripped apart by a troubled and evil coward. Now, when lives are lost and innocence is stolen, particularly when children are the victims, it's natural to want to assess and focus blame. Who did this and, and how did this happen? 
And I'm no different than any American. I'm heartbroken and I'm furious. Those innocent children are gone and the indescribable suffering of the families is beyond words. We have a president that says continually that he must do something. We must do something. Many Democrats are echoing that. We must do something. No, we need to do something effective that will keep our children safely. As I mentioned, when a senseless tragedy like this happens, blame is thrown around. Some people want to blame guns. Some people want to blame gun manufacturers. Some people want to blame, believe it or not, the Constitution. Some people want to blame an entire political party. And all this couldn't be more misplaced. The shooter is the only one to blame. So when the president and many Democrats are claiming that guns are the problem and the readily available supply is the culprit, well, the more guns in America there are even goes, the more dangerous America becomes. America becomes. But the actual facts belie this thinking. In 1969, so about 50 years ago, there were 180 million firearms in this country. Today, it's about double. 2019, it was about 365 million. Yet the murder rate back then was 9.6 per 100,000. Murder rate now is five, or in 2019 anyway, it was five per 100,000. So twice the number of guns, and yet murder rate was cut in half. This guy's the truth is, that guns have always been readily available there. in this country. But mass shootings, and in particularly mass shootings, of schools were non-existent or at least extremely rare until they became a grisly recent phenomenon. So what's changed in the last 50 years? Media, say media. There's been a noticeable breakdown of the family, there's been an erosion of faith, and there's been a seismic drop in social interactions in large measure due to the overuse of these dang smartphones and the proliferation of social media, which is probably better described as anti-social media. Senseless mass shootings are not committed by well-adjusted, successful, socially polished people. Mm -hmm. They're committed by disturbed, yep. unstable yeah, voters with mental at the end of the year, so we we'll started now. Madam Chair, you... Madam Chair, can I get my time back? Yeah. Thank you. We'll allow what we don't want. Whoa. Thank you. Senseless mass shootings are committed by unstable, disturbed loners with mental disease, refusing to address better mental health services, especially for young people, is to do a disservice at best, and it's a dereliction of duty at worst. The focus, sadly, by the Democrats is to restrict guns or prohibit their legal possession entirely. A Democratic member of Congress in a committee hearing uh, just recently said, and I quote, we will not rest until we have taken weapons of war out of circulation in our communities. So, do restrictive gun laws or prohibitions work? The most dangerous nations on the planet, according to the World Bank and the UN, are El Salvador, Jamaica, Venezuela, and Honduras. What else do they have in common? It's also nearly impossible for an average citizen to own a firearm, and yet they are terribly perilous places to be. Believe it or not, some Democratic-controlled cities in our country with restrictive gun laws are even more dangerous than the aforementioned countries. St. Louis has a higher murder rate than El Salvador. Baltimore does as well, and Detroit is a more lethal and dangerous place to go and visit or live than Venezuela. So does passing prohibitions, I mean, it just simply doesn't work. Doing something doesn't work. Doing something effective is a path that we should and must take. History has shown us when you disarm law-abiding citizens, you create not more safety, but more peril. The inconvenient truth for some on this committee and in this chamber is that more firearms in the hands of law-abiding citizens make us all safer. So let's talk some real solutions. We must harden our schools with controlled access and single point of entry with the tiered entry procedures. The main office should be located directly by the front door, which is single access entry. Classroom doors should automatically shut and lock like hotel room doors. Let's support and foster a robust martial, school martial program where qualified and volunteer teachers and staff go through proper training to be armed on campus. Let's increase the number of SROs in our schools. Let's leverage technology by putting cameras in schools, much like Frisco, Texas did 15 years ago when I was on a city council and they had a command center and a mobile command center and any threat could be immediately detected, tracked, and eliminated forthwith. We need to rapid response plan and rapid points. response force to I'm wondering if they just tuned out the way we tuned out when they blather on about their bullshit. Change. So when there is a threat, the schools aren't besieged, but rather our heroes in blue advance. I doubt they want to hear about hardening schools. All they care about is the opportunity to remove the guns. So I think you have to put a different care in front of them than this. This is preaching to the people that care about hardening the schools, for sure. Let's look at real and effective solutions and shelve the divisive rhetoric. What's up with this closed captioning? He's not saying citizen, citizen. Thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. O'Connor, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
like so many on this committee and around the country, I was deeply moved, not as a politician, as a father, by the testimony this morning of the families of victims. Kimberly Rubio, who lost her precious daughter, Lexi, cut through all the talking points, all the debate, and asked the central question before our Congress and our country. And she put it, what do we value more? Children or our guns? No, well, that's a it's false, really that false uh, what do you call it, false uh, choice. I want to So we're going to go back to the one hour, 47 minute mark and listen to the first DC project testimony right after this couple's testimony. Not knowing that our reality. That was well thought Thank out and not testimony. exploitive of their grief. Excuse, you are now recognized for your testimony. It's nice to know they uh, pray Chair people Walman. out like that. Honorable Chairwoman Maloney, ranking member, Homer, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to be here today to address the violence in our country. My name is Lucretia Hughes Klukin. I have four children and nine grandchildren. On the night of April the 2nd, 2016, my family got a phone call that would change our lives forever. My ex-husband answered the phone and let out a blood curdling scream, a scream of pain from the depths of his soul. He screamed, he cried, he's gone, he is gone. Our 19 year old son, Emmanuel, went to a party early that night. After we got the call, we was frantic. We called his phone, no one answered. We called even the police. I went to Facebook and I had to ask, is my son dead? I found out that he was shot point blank in the head and killed while playing dominoes. No one spoke up for weeks, and the killer was on the run. No one was going to snitch, but that is the street life. Honorable Chairwoman, words can describe how hard it is to bury a child. I ache for anyone and all who have done the same. My son's death was a result of a criminal with an evil heart and a justice system failing to hold him accountable for the laws he had already broken. You see, a convicted felon killed my son with an illegally obtained gun. Our gun control lobbyists and politicians claim that their policies will save lives and reduce violence. Well, those policies did not save my son. The laws being discussed are all My son was shot in the head and killed in cities across this country. We have decades of evidence proving they do not work. St. Louis, New York, Chicago, Washington, Atlanta are gun control utopias, and they are plagued with the most violence. Ten more laws. 20 more laws, a thousand more, won't make what has already illegal more wrong or stop criminals from committing these crimes. And y'all are delusional if you think it's gonna keep us safe. I am a walking testimony of how the criminal justice system and the gun control laws, which is steeped in racism, by the way, have failed the black community. By the age of 25, I had already went to 18 young black men funeral at the age of 25. I have one black man in jail, one black man in the grave, and my young grandson going to be raised without a father. And it's a curse on the black community and everyone else's. Something has to change. Thoughts and prayers and calls for more gun control isn't enough. How about letting me defend myself from evil? I, you don't think that I'm capable and trustworthy to handle a firearm. You don't think that the Second Amendment doesn't apply to people 
that look like me? Who and you who would call for more gun controls are the same ones that are calling to defund the police? Who is supposed to protect us? We must prepare to be our own first responders to protect ourselves and our loved ones. I am a legal, law-abiding citizen, and I don't need the government to save me. I teach people how to use a firearm. I empower others to look at me to understand the Second Amendment is their right. I am a proud member of the DC Project, Women for Gun Rights. We believe that education is the key to safety, not ineffective legislation. We support meaningful solutions that will actually save lives. We support the Safe Student Act, HR 7415, which would immediately make schools safer. In hindsight of Parkland, we saw failure of the government at every level failing the students. Students saw something and they said something and the school did not act. Police were called to his residence over 30 times and they did not act. And finally, the police did not go into their school that fateful day and failed to protect those kids. We need to secure our secure our schools and we gotta secure this building or like y'all do. What's the difference? We call on Congress to ban gun free zones, fund nonpartisan firearm education programs like Kids Safe Foundation and non governmental mental health organizations like Hold my guns and in closing i claim that nothing in these bills oh, do anything to make us safer or address the mental health crisis in this country despite living with the heartache of losing my son on a daily basis i believe it is our god-given right to defend ourselves from any act of violence making it more difficult or even more expensive for me and people that look like me and other law abiding citizens will not make us safer. It will embolden the criminals. Gun owners are not the enemies in these gun control policies are not the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your powerful, and meaningful and gut-wrenching testimony. Uh, we will now pause and you are excused and we will pause while we uh, seat the next panel for their testimony. So there you go. And that was at about the one hour and 47 minute mark. There's also a DC project video that's six minutes and 55 seconds that I've linked in the description. I'm going to hit live real quick and see what they're saying now. Um, previous testimony that I've given before the Senate Judiciary so this is Committee Amy on Swearer. Gun She's a researcher. I think here in Tucson. She's question, written um, some legal from stuff. From a federal perspective, as I said, I continue to and enforce federal laws. Uh, in for this, this, criminals this accountable testimony. at a federal level when possible and right. encourage well, state maybe. and local counterparts, some of whom uh, have done a horrific job of this, to do the same. Yeah, so, I just have a question. There's, there's a call that the Nick system. Mic, so she has to keep uh, moving around. And when you purchase a firearm, as uh, I don't know how many people in this room have ever have ever gone through a background check, but it does ask questions. I know it was brought up earlier about criminals uh, being able to purchase guns. Is it not already illegal for rapists and and murderers and people who have done domestic violence and convicted of these things? Is it already illegal for them to purchase firearms? I, to purchase and to possess, assuming they are felons and have not had their rights restored to them under existing state or federal processes, though there is no process under federal law, so it would just be under the state. Okay, but, but the point is, it's already, we're, we're not saying that criminals should have laws, we're saying criminals should be put in jail, and law-abiding citizens should be allowed to, to uh, lawfully possess them. 
that is certainly what I'm saying, and that is my understanding of what every member who has opposed HR8 is saying as well. Thank you. I yield back. So we're Gentleman live again back. right now. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Fume is recognized for five minutes. I hope I didn't miss it. Thank you very here. much, uh, Madam Chair. There's a old saying that your pain is where your passion is. So let me just go back to where we started almost uh, three hours ago at the beginning of this hearing and talk for a second about the pain that I felt, as I hope many of you did, listening firsthand to the accounts of witnesses and victims from Uvalde and uh, from Buffalo. Um, so now listening we're to them, go to... I am still stunned and heartbroken. This is about the one hour and 16 minute mark, I think. Oh, no, this is an hour and 16 minutes ago. So it's the. Uh, we still can't hear you. Turn your mic on. So they messed with her for a little while. A little closer to. But this is Amy Swearer's testimony from earlier. See, they on. killed her mic. They're messing with her. I'll fast forward. My name is Amy Swearer, and I'm a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where my scholarship focuses on the Second Amendment and gun violence prevention. I have testified before various legislatures after several mass shootings, <laughs> Parkland, Virginia Beach, El Paso, and unfortunately, too many others. And I hope to God this is the last time I ever have to testify before a legislative body after a mass shooting event. I fear that it won't be. And I fear that it won't be because the conversation has become predictable. An unspeakably horrific event like Uvalde or Buffalo happens, reflexively, almost compulsively, come calls for Congress to pass a whole host of gun control measures, largely targeting peaceable law-abiding citizens. Should anyone dare question the constitutionality, practicality, or even the effectiveness of any of these policies, their opposition is immediately framed as callous obstructionism and their legitimate concerns are brushed aside as, and I quote, bullshit. Any viable alternatives are deemed frivolous without so much as a passing thought to their usefulness. And so I will once again run through all of the problems with Syria, or the serious problems with commonly proposed gun control measures. It's all detailed in my written submission, which I hope you read. Semi-automatic rifles are the type of firearm least often used to commit acts of gun violence. Pistol grips and barrel shrouds don't make them any more or less deadly in the context of mass shootings. While these, while these features can and do make a difference in the context of lawful self-defense for civilians, which is why millions of peaceable Americans own them. Standard capacity magazines are commonly possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes. The few rigorous studies on their prohibition have found that the evidence for their success at lowering rates of gun violence is inconclusive at best. The context in which mass public shootings occur renders magazine limits effectively useless at saving lives. 18 to 20 year olds are legal adults otherwise endowed with all of the rights and duties of citizenship, including the right to keep and bear arms. Even if it were constitutionally appropriate to punish a mass of responsible young adults because a handful of them committed atrocities, the vast majority of mass public shooters are 21 or older. And then I'll repeat the same viable alternatives that would be far more effective in a far more immediate way again, detailed in the written submission that I hope you read. Take violent crime seriously under existing federal laws and encourage your state and local counterparts to do the same. Authorize schools to shift the over $100 billion in unused COVID relief funds to physical security improvements, the hiring of armed trained staff, and the hiring of licensed mental health professionals. Promote responsible gun ownership without simultaneously imposing financial burdens on gun owners or hindering their ability to immediately respond to violent threats. Invest in the nation's mental health infrastructure to combat the two-thirds of gun deaths that are suicides. The list goes on. Now, Congressman, I am fully aware that when you are burying your child, nuanced policy discussions are irrelevant. It doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter to a fourth grader hiding under her desk, covering herself in her dead classmate's blood, whether the real problem here is a barrel shroud or the several dozen missed opportunities to intervene along the way. But it should matter to you because you are the ones making public policy decisions. Hmm. Many of you are the ones implying that a lot of victims would be alive today, but for a mass shooter's pistol grip and a background check that he already passed. 
Many of you are the same ones mocking anybody for, quote, talking about doors when a single locked door in Uvalde would likely have saved 21 lives. And when all of us just walked in here today into this building with its limited public access points, its one-way one way locking security doors, and its plethora of armed officers. What happened in Uvalde and in Buffalo is horrific. It is horrifying. No one should ever have to experience that type of unfathomable trauma. And I cannot even begin to imagine what those families are going through right now. Everybody with a soul has it shattered over acts like this. And we have seen it shattered every single time from Columbia to Parkland to Uvalde. We did not somehow, this, this didn't get easier for us. This, we did not grow numb somewhere along the way to the reality of this. It's not as though our family members don't also teach fourth graders, or we don't also send our kids to school. It's not as though we don't also shop in grocery stores or go to country music festivals or work in hospitals, as though we don't also feel the tremendous, horrible weight of these tragedies somewhere deep inside of our souls, because we do. Because we, we get abused twice. These policies, precisely because the lives of these victims matter, because the grief of their loved ones is real, because we all want thriving communities where families are flourishing, so burying their children. The opposition has always been and is still today a genuine concern that these policies suffer from serious constitutional and practical defects, that they will not have the impact you promise people they will. And we have always proposed alternatives that would be more effective and less constitutionally suspect. What we have rarely been met with are open years. And I hope for the nation's sake that today is different because I would really love to never testify after a mass shooting again. Thank you. Thank all of you for your very important testimony. I now recognize myself uh, for questions. As a mother, it is hard to find All words right, I'm to live again. We'll see what they're saying. Now. 140 million. 15 million American men came home from World War II. With deep so you scars can see in the little preview window. Skills. Put Brian in there. They so you can see at the little preview window down here how often in, in and her white everywhere. jacket or whatever shows up down here where they're asking her questions this was that guy from texas who was one of those men had pretty the succinct points this is the guy who, who gives ultimatums you either love children or you love guns and hate children they guns kind of everywhere but virtually no regulation any child in the 50s could buy a weapon from any seller if daddy sent them with the money we didn't have mass shootings wasn't until 1968 in America that serial numbers were even required on weapons sold in this country. You order weapons through the Sears catalog by the mail. 19 in the 70s, I attended a high school, large rural school. Virtually every vehicle in the parking lot was a pickup truck, and almost every one had a rifle or a shotgun on the back glass and a pistol in under the seat. We didn't have school shootings. 1979, I began college. One of the jobs I had to work my way through college was as a carpenter. We restored historical buildings. We had to determine in the process of that work, what was the original cuts of these, these homes, residential homes built 75, 85, 100 years ago. You could tell by the saw cut if it was a Mechanical cut, an electric cut, or a hand cut. By such observations, we knew exactly how that house was originally built. And to my amazement, as a young man, beginning college in Louisiana, working, to my amazement, oh, you know what is? I discovered, Madam Chair? You know what these houses did not have that were built 100 years ago? in cities in america you know what they did not have commissioner locks locks now i ask you all what happened to that country man 
What are you country talking about? Country where homes were built in cities with no locks. I think I got to take a country over. where guns were oh, everywhere, virtually not regulated at all. Where millions of Americans, um, 14 million Ozzie Americans, be came back to 11 percent of the population at the time after World War II with incredible skills of war and weapons of war, as you call them, everywhere. But we didn't have mass shootings. And here we sit today, where an entire once proud Democratic Party is pre presenting unbelievably unconstitutional laws to press upon our nation. And we have a police commissioner that says he would go home to home and confiscate legally owned weapons if he got a tip. Madam Chair, I yield my speech, but I will not yield my opposition to these unconstitutional laws. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, is recognized. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairwoman, and thank you to all of our witnesses here today. I apologize if I go quickly. We've just got five minutes and a lot of work to do. Um, let's talk facts here. There's a lot of discussion about New York City. There is no discussion about gun violence in New York City without discussing the iron pipeline that is Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and honorary mention to Ohio, where 70% of likely illegal trafficked guns found in New York City come from. There's no discussion about gun violence in Chicago without talking about Indiana. Because the violence and the mothers that we have to comfort are losing children due to the guns and the carnage and the lawlessness unleashed by those states. I move on. Every week in recent memory, we have had at least one mass shooting. Ms. Pringle, you are the president of the National Education uh, Association. You represent teachers. And between 2009 and 2018, how many school shootings did the United States have? 288. 288. Now let's look globally. Our G7 partners, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the United Kingdom. Them. Combined, how many did those countries, how many school shootings did those countries have? Five. Five. Times. In 10, almost 10 years. 288 versus five. This is not normal. Not only is it not normal, it is internationally embarrassing and uh -oh. delegitimizing to the United States. Because for all the billions and trillions that this all right, this is a good time to go back and see some more stuff from Amy. Sorry about that. That's horrible. Not normal. We have it's not normal. People under eighteen talking about shootings and mass shootings, and these companies are taking no action. So we need to have regulation that gets to the heart of this. Companies are taking their action. I, that seems to, to be ignoring position, the action that's being taken by the companies. Simple yes or no questions to understand where you're coming from. Is it your view that someone who has committed a violent felony should be able to purchase a gun? Yes or no? No. Is it your view that someone who's a serial rapist should be able to purchase a gun? Yes or no? Very clearly no. Is it your view that someone who is a drug trafficker should be able to purchase a gun? Yes or no? No, and these are becoming insulting. And so, well, I mean, so would you support any laws that would make sure that violent felons, serial rapists, or people who are drug traffickers will not get access to uh, guns? If they are written and narrowly tailored to approach that issue without burdening the rights of law-abiding citizens or criminalizing low-risk transfers between responsible citizens, yes, I'm more than willing to look at that law. That is exactly what the background checks, I mean, because right now what you have a case is that the background checks do not cover a lot of the sales to violent felons, to serial rapists. And I just want to be clear, when the Republican Party, their position right now by opposing H.R. 8 is they are for violent felons, serial rapists still being able to purchase these guns. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, this, they're not. They're is, against hey, low-risk transfers time, being criminalized. My time. Please, I'm reclaiming my time. This is... This Point of order, Madam Chair, the ballot, the, the position of Republicans is that ballot criminals be in jail. Well, no, the, the position is... Madam I, Chair, the gentleman has not stated a valid point of order. The, 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 the position, H.R. 8, all H.R. 8 at its core said 
is that violent felons are still getting these guns. Seal, serial rapists are still getting these guns. And the law and order party that, that, that has demagogued the issue of law enforcement and policing, that party is saying, we're okay with violent felons still getting these guns. We're okay with serial rapists still getting these guns. And all the Congress on the Democratic side is trying to do. So is this guy is trying to create a situation. Are you to my testimony on this against. very bill before the Senate I, Judiciary I, Committee I'm last year where I explained how that is a grotesque mischaracterization of our opposition to that gun? She's awesome. I am saying that there is a not a grotesque not misrepresentation, but you kept interrupting me. A grotesque misrepresentation, buddy. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Keller, is now recognized. A grotesque misrepresentation uh, I, I of our like opposition. To take a to thank all our that is where uh, they're this at. Panel and That's all panel they've got. For your testimony. They're depending uh, on. We've uh, seen some horrific acts in the, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, we saw a devastating uh, shooting in Philadelphia on Saturday. Uh, and I continue. And we all should offer prayer for the families. Across the Commonwealth so and across our nation back. that have been affected. Pause again. Let's go live. Jim, ladies, time has expired. Oh, I missed, Wisconsin. I missed the Mr. whole part section. I'm sorry, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, the last couple of weeks, I had a chance to go around to Mexico, and it brought up an issue I wasn't really expecting to hear. But a couple of Border Patrol guys pointed out to me that, um, uh, that firearms were very, very regular. Mexico, and you do a little Google search and you find out a recent article in the Wall Street Journal the first six, first six or first nine months uh, in 2019, Mexico, with some wildly difficult laws, had a, a murder rate of six times that in the United States. Something like six percent more, not 60 percent more. But assuming you got it right, maybe it was charitable to be here. I don't know. Six times is is in the United States. I assume the Mexican officials who put these laws into effect thought they were going to save lives at the time that they made it so difficult for law-abiding Mexicans to get a hold of a firearm. But obviously, the results of their laws was not to make Mexico safer. Look at those closed there captions. For a law, was Mexicans to get a hold of people uh, who have died now in Mexico under the current rules connected to uh, ownership of guns. Uh, we've also, in this country, had a dramatic increase in the number of deaths from guns the last two years since kind of the beginning, or at least expansion of the I Hate Police movement, uh, which I blame for all the uh, young people and not so young people who have died in the last two years in this massive increase of murders that we see almost unprecedented. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, more quiet with the story for, to comment a little bit on, on that Mexican statistic and comment on the dramatic increase in the number of uh, homicides in this country in the last two years. Not because it's easier to own guns, but kind of because rhetoric, a lot of the rhetoric coming out of this building, uh, this anti police rhetoric. Congressman, I will respectfully refrain from commenting on the, the statistics you pointed out from Mexico. I'm, I'm not overly familiar uh, with any of the underlying causes. I, I will, you know, to the greater point, say Mexico is, to my awareness, one of the only other countries in the world with a right to, quote, keep and bear arms, um, which is sort of a misnomer in that country, as you point out. Um, so it's fundamentally different understanding uh, of what that means than clearly in, in our country. Um, as to, I'm sorry, please remind me of the, the second aspect. Well, the, the massive increase in murders in this country in the last. I, look, I, I think it's it's hard to pin that down to any like, one simplistic notion of what is causing that. Uh, certainly, I, I think um, problems with policing and, and calls to, to defund the police, loss of uh, trust between communities and, and police members, that all plays a role, as I, I pointed out in my written. Submission, okay. but I, I think it's a number I'll, of things. Yeah, I'll give you another question. Then. Um, this week, I'll be reintroducing something called the Student and Teacher Safety Act, which will allow schools to use existing grants they have uh, meant in part for improving school conditions and learning to improve or boost school safety. Following the Uvalde shooting, 
White House press secretary. The White House press secretary said that President Biden does not believe in hardening schools to provide more security resources or law enforcement officers. If these measures can be effective in preventing another mass shooting, why do you think the president is not open uh, to hardening schools this way? I cannot read the president's mind, um, but my guess is he would rather focus on other ways of addressing it. I'd also very quickly like to point out, um, to reference something Congressman Fume said, uh, to, to seem to infer that we only care about or have only mentioned one aspect of a, a greater issue, which is focusing on physical security. Um, Congressman, I respectfully don't know if you were not here for my opening statement or have not read my written submission, um, but I respectfully have pointed out roughly a dozen other issues as well. This is comprehensive in nature. It is not one thing or the other. It is both. I've and. been here for three hours since before the hearing started. I heard your testimony. My reference was to schools, and my reminder was, those are Madam not Chair, I think he's out of order. Gentleman is not recognized. Yeah. Witness, address me, Madam Chair. Okay. Could you give me another few seconds back? So I'm um, well, could you give us, if, if, uh, if President Biden is going to stand between uh, us and trying to improve the physical security in the school districts, can you give us other ideas that we can use to prevent these tragedies? Sure. As I mentioned in both my written and oral testimony, I think we can focus very clearly on uh, building up the nation's mental health infrastructure, both specifically in schools and generally across the board. Mm -hmm. We are talking about two thirds of gun deaths every year that are suicides, which is clearly plays into a, an aspect of mental health, which is problematic. We are talking about with mass shootings, individuals who clearly um, show signs of being a danger to themselves or others, but who are otherwise you know, not felons yet and oftentimes cannot be involuntarily civilly committed. Um, so looking at you know targeted interventions with adequate means of due process um, and also just behavioral risk assessment. You know, we, we've talked about Instagram and threats on Instagram. What's concerning to me is that so many people saw so many signs, especially in Uvalde, day, and it appears that nobody reported them or knew to report them or knew how to report them or didn't think anything would be done about it. Um, and, and that the gentleman's time has expired. Okay, the, the gentle lady from California, Ms. Porter, is now recognized. Ms. Swear, in 2019, you testified on Representative Cicilline's bill, the assault weapons ban before Congress. At the 2019 hearing, Representative Jim Jordan asked you if law-abiding people will be less safe to protect themselves if that bill was passed. Do you remember your response? I have a general idea of what I would have said under that circumstance, but no, I don't remember my specific words. You said, and I quote, I think worse than that, sir, you will see millions of otherwise law abiding citizens become felons overnight. Yes. For nothing more than having scary looking features on firearms. It's I was true. quite surprised by your answer. You read the bill before you came to Congress to testify against it, yes? Uh, if we are referring to the ban on assault weapons, correct. correct. Yes. So you knew that the bill would allow any gun owner to maintain possession of any semi-automatic assault weapon that was lawfully possessed before the bill became law. No. Uh, so that is the case under that bill. The problem is any time that time. is transferred to anybody Reclaiming else, my time. that now becomes chair, an issue. Please respect yeah. the witness. The time belongs to me. If you don't want to hear an answer to my question, I, I'm not sure Gen what's being asked. The gentlelady has reclaimed her time. So you knew that the bill, you said yes in response to my question, that you knew <laughs> the bill would allow the gun owner to maintain possession of any semi-automatic assault weapon that was lawfully possessed before the bill becomes law. Swear, I respect that we have different opinions on Representative Cicilline's assault weapons law, but we cannot have different facts. We have a duty to debate the merits of proposal. You falsely testified under oath. Would you that like that the bill, explanation? Of no, I will not. I have not yielded, Ms. Swear. Suspend. Madam Chair, if she's going to ask questions, shouldn't she let the witness have time to answer? The gentleman is not recognized. You falsely testified Madam, under Madam oath. Madam Chair, point of order. Point of order. <laughs> I've been accused of falsely testifying the, under oath, the, and I would like to the, address the, it. The gentlewoman has accused her of perjury. Is she going to hold to that, or are you going to allow the witness to respond to that accusation of, of criminal conduct? You, you have not come forward with a, a, a significant point of order. 
Ms. Porter will continue. I asked you if that bill was correct, if the bill would allow any gun owner to maintain possession, and you said yes, yet you testified that the bill would allow people to become felons overnight. Earlier today, you testified that you hoped that this was the last the time you testified that Amy's before Congress. Going through right now. For the sake of our nation and the integrity because of this of Congress, I saw Congress too. after a mass shooting trying to figure out how to solve a problem that we are all heavily invested in solving. Ms. Ware, I have not asked a question. Of order. Point of order. How dare you? Reclaiming my time. How dare you misstate the law? Oh my how goodness. dare you ask Legislation. questions that you do not even want an answer to? Ms. Ware, I'm moving on. <laughs> I'm, I'm a lifelong consumer. She did protection that just advocate. to fluster her. From 2015 to 2020, there were at least 2,070 right unintentional shootings up. by children. 765 of those children died. A consumer product that causes this much harm to the public would normally be subject to a recall. But federal law prohibits the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the agency responsible for protecting the public from dangerous products from regulating guns. This is absurd. After one child died, using a Peloton treadmill last year, the Consumer Product Safety Commission intervened and recalled the product. But when hundreds of children die using guns, there is no federal response. There is no federal safety standard for guns. Even though 40,000 Americans hurt or kill themselves or other people in hundreds of accidents every year, instead of regulating guns like any other consumer product, federal law protects gun manufacturers. A teenager can watch a video online and learn how to modify a rifle to make it more deadly. Uh -oh. And the gun industry avoids any liability if that teenager uses that modified rifle to fire repeatedly and rapidly at innocent people, even though their products could be designed to prevent unsafe modifications. I want to give an example. In 2001, a 13-year-old boy named Billy accidentally shot his father's handgun and killed his friend Josh. Billy mistakenly thought the gun was unloaded because he had removed the gun's magazine. Josh's family sued the gun manufacturer for failing to warn Billy and other consumers that their product could be fired without a magazine. It's a simple case. It should have been decided by a jury, as is provided under the Constitution. Instead, because of the gun industry's immunity, the gun manufacturer was able to dismiss the case without a trial. If a pharmaceutical company failed to warn customers about the known risks of one of their drugs, they could face thousands of lawsuits but we allow the gun industry to sell weapons without taking any precautions to protect children and families from fatal accidents. Well, she's ignoring Mr. Sapira, all the precautions that are taken by the industry. Do you think the gun industry would do more to, to protect, protect children anything. if Congress ended their immunity? The immunity is Absolutely. against frivolous would lawsuits. Would ending the gun industry's immunity put gun manufacturers out of business? No, it would not. In the 1990s, lawsuits forced big tobacco to pay for the harm they caused by, by marketing cigarettes. Just last year, Big Pharma agreed to pay $26 billion for communities devastated by opioids. Madam Chair, Victims Johnson, of gun sorry. violence also deserve their day in court. They deserve justice. I yield back. The gentlelady's time is... Madam time. Chair, I have a Madam, parliamentary Madam, brief. The gentlelady's time Madam is Chair, is Madam is Chair, Chair I have a point of order. Madam Chair, point of order. Uh, again, Ms. Porter... What is that guy? Our witness of perjury. That's a I want one of them guys to bring me stuff and have me on the back and coach me and give me a piece of paper. No, that is not a proper the point, point of order. The point of order is we just had a proper point of order. We just accused a witness of perjury. Well, well, Madam Chair, the, the gentleman is not stating a proper point of order. The gentlelady will order a gentleman from the state is recognized. Mr. Cloud, you're now recognized. Let me take that piece of paper. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. And obviously this is a tragedy that's heartbreaking for all of us. Oh, uh, Miss What's Her Face took off after she got of as she accused uh, Amy of uh, lying on their testimony. She took off this nice nation. political uh, moves there. Gonna be a thousand Think about Amy. We're Why showing up in D.C. Asking, I'm pretty sure she has some tent from Arizona. Ongoing, obviously, some answers, of course, will never, uh, even the conclusions we can come up with will, of course, never okay. answer. Can these people talk quieter? I'm going to go back and see if we can find more good stuff from Amy. As we move forward, we have to continue to, to figure out 
how we propose solutions that actually need uh, very often. This was from about the one hour something mark. These little children were not the ones you were talking about stopping, correct? And the See what they do? They turn off our microphone. And Miss, Miss Swear, your your mic's not on. But let me ask you just to clarify. You're talking I, about I can slaughtering hear you, children. Swear. Oh, it's your good. mic's not I can, on. I can hear Miss Swear. And then, oh, it's like I don't need it to be on the record. I just needed to fluster her. I just needed perhaps, their perhaps person who understands the situation to get messed up. Like this way. To, to be emotional. Can you please suspend the time? The witness needs to be heard. Restore the time, please. Thank you. Congressman. Can I repeat the question and then you can say the answer? Yeah, and if we could just stop the clock for a minute because we lost some time there. Could Go I ahead. change the clock or it's true? Mr. Chris Morton, did you want to repeat the question? Yes. Ms. Swear, uh, when you talked about the stopping power of these AR 15s, you it wasn't these children that you were talking about stopping, obviously. No, I was referring to individuals like the one who went into that building and spent 78 minutes shooting them. And I hope, as was the case in Uvalde, that the people who show up to stop shooters like that and these have the AR-15 precisely for its stopping power. And that is exactly what happened in Uvalde. That and this, cops in this are case, I swear, from this, these this, this man from legally purchased these AR-15 in rifle, condom. correct? And in this particular case, the shooter had legally purchased these AR-15. It's in Uvalde. Martha, do you want to repeat the question? Yes. Ms. Swear, uh, when you talked about the stopping power of these AR-15s, it wasn't these children that you were talking about stopping. What an obviously. asshole. What an asshole No, I was to referring ask. to individuals like the one who went into that building and spent 78 minutes shooting them. And I hope, as was the case in Uvalde, that the people who show up to stop shooters like that and these have the AR-15 precisely for its stopping power. And that is exactly what happened in Uvalde. And this, my cops in this are case, keenly exempt. From these, these prohibitions, this, this man legally purchased these AR-15 rifles, correct? And in this particular case, the shooter had legally purchased these AR-15 rifles and was able to stop and obviously end these lives for, forever. Yes. Now, Commissioner Magley, I want to have I want to address you again, Commissioner. You know, guns are often uh, billed as essential to maintaining the freedoms we enjoy in America. Uh, they are an iconic part of America to a lot of people, but cars have long been central to American life as well. And what we've seen, interestingly, is that <laughs> here's a picture of that traffic about? deaths versus was deaths for? from firearms. And at one time, traffic deaths far exceeded firearms in 1950. But over time, traffic deaths have gone down, while firearm deaths have remained relatively constant. Now, of course, with regard to the right to bear arms, that's in the Constitution, but it's not an absolute Look at that right. Massive that's why we outlaw machine guns and we regulate deaths. firearms in other and he ways. says that's relatively Sir, constant. Uh, with a regard to traffic deaths in cars, massive decline, almost the imposition 50 percent decline of in the two thousands. and laws, along with private industry adopting safer ways to drive and uh, devices to make them safer, have led to a reduction in traffic deaths. But the same cannot be said for firearms. Is that isn't that right? Oh, it's right. just yes. about the same We're time there was concealed carry laws going down. Regulations, both in vehicle safety, airbags, uh, speed enforcement, other things of that nature have led right. to heading back to live. Make sure we come back to this. And uh, I would just like to give whatever time remains to Ms. Swear to to address the, the burdering charges that have been made against you. The, the gentleman's time has expired. The gentle lady from Florida is Watson yeah. Schultz's number. You gave that time Thank to her. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. The whole time. Gun manufacturers didn't always market weapons of war to civilians, and until recently, trade shows didn't make military-style guns available to the general public. Now, gun makers aggressively market AR-15-style weapons to civilians and actively tie them to military and law enforcement weapons. Smith & Wesson, America's largest gun manufacturer, even developed a name for this marketing ploy calling it the, quote, halo effect. Now, I want to draw your attention to the screen. 
Mr. Suplina, I want to ask you about one advertisement that I find troubling. This one. This is an ad for a Daniel Defense MK-18, a high-speed military-style AR similar to the Daniel Defense AR used at the Robb Elementary School shooting in Uvalde. The ad states, quote, use what they use, and that the gun features, quote, military-adopted technology. Mr. Suplina, do you believe the associations made in this advertisement are appropriate for a civilian? No, but they're very effective at selling military-style weapons to the civilian population. Reports on this gun indicate that it's favored by special forces. I would like to ask Daniel Defense why the same style guns being used in war zones should be marketed to everyday people. What? It is clear who gun makers are marketing to. Fred Guttenberg lost his 14-year-old daughter, Jamie, in the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School massacre in my own community. Fred filed an FTC complaint alleging that Smith & Wesson mimicked first-person shooter video games in its advertising materials to attract adolescents and young adults. Smith & Wesson's M&P 15 223 caliber rifle was used in the Parkland massacre. Mr. Suplino, what level of culpability should gun manufacturers have when they market human killing machines to a civilian customer? Again, this, this is now- So this is showing that they can't go after gun owners. They gotta go after the gun companies and they've gotta misrepresent the placa or whatever, the protection from disruption of lawful commerce. They suggest that they're the only ones with some sort of immunity from nuisance lawsuits. However, I think if you look at anything that's considered a core industry of the United States would have a similar uh, protection. So now they're going after the advertising because the Remington lawsuit was effective. They can use it as an optic because the Remington is a brand name with a liability attached to it. That liability uh, has, you know, the company that owns the liability has an insurance company. And when the company, the brand was sued, the insurance company decided to go with what would cost the least amount of money, which was settlement, they thought. They didn't care or have any skin in the game for the optics or the implication that would have for our rights or for the industry or for other manufacturers or anything like that. And that's a consequence of a lot of things in capitalism, right? So now you have Remington blood in the water and you have lawyers now attempting different avenues and different tactics and different vectors towards uh, suing manufacturers. If you read the book, Glock America's Gun, uh, there's a really good section in there about how the Saturday Night Special Ring of Fire guns were sued in the 90s for the well, to put them out of business. And then when they got that taste of blood, the attorneys and anti-gun types went after Glock and Glock effectively stifled that and pretty much that in the Hillary hole with Smith & Wesson is when that placa thing came around. So this is something they've been attacking since the Clintons, and this is something they've wanted since the Clintons. It's nothing new. It's just a tactic, and it's a dusty old one that's never worked. It's an indication that they're pulling everything out of the war chest. It's an indication that they are either greedy or delusional. It's an indication that they're counting coup. They're able to throw stuff out there knowing that if it passes, they win. And if it doesn't pass, they can pander to their base and say that we attempted everything you could have ever wanted. And they can just pick the name who they want to blame. They're not going to be able to blame gun owners because the DC project, which is here, who we're here to, rep, to acknowledge, the DC project has effectively changed the face of gun ownership. Amy Swearer, who is effectively single handedly uh, challenging all of these accusations, false accusations, and grotesque uh, assumptions. Uh, ladies like her are challenging the perception of firearms ownership. So what they have to do is attack entities. They have to attack larger institutions that will either default to uh, articulation. I don't know what the word is. They like default to settlement, or they'll just go out of business. So this is a bullying tactic, a, a signal that they're desperate. It's a great time to, to look to national level organizations to 
push for real changes. This isn't a time to sit on the sidelines, get active, and then push those, look for those organizations that are pushing, because just as they're putting everything out there, it means that they can't defend any of it. This is a perfect time. Everything they brought out on the table today has at least three organizations that have been working for potentially seven years to counteract the false narratives and the grotesque assumptions that they use here. They're pulling out dusty old garbage. So it's frustrating to watch, but don't get distracted by it and definitely don't get disheartened in the long run. But then we this is so the final acts of desperation and of people who are running for uh, re-election uh, at a time when it's critical and they have absolutely the everything to distract us from them, and absolutely you, nothing to stand on as an accomplishment. The Democrats did today is they took hmm. a person, a young person, little Mia, who was traumatized. Listen to this. This sounds good. Still suffering under obvious PTSD, as she testified in that video. And bringing that poor little girl to relive this. And if we're going to hear about how traumatic, and I don't say they're not traumatic, these raising money for Stop the Bleed Kids is, then it's particularly pernicious and outrageous to take an 11 year old child who graphically described how she spread. A classmate's blood upon her and feigned her own death to make her relive that. If we're talking about PTSD, you just prolonged the agony of that little child. For what? For your own political gain, your own political purpose. That is despicable. And over the course of more than nine hours last week, my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee, my Democrat colleagues, made it clear that they don't believe any American should have access to the means to protect themselves and their families. Democrats opposed a Republican amendment that would allow victims of domestic violence to purchase firearms. They opposed a Republican amendment that would allow the spouses of active duty and deployed military to purchase firearms. And again, they promote, promoted ending the filibuster, packing the Supreme Court and confiscating guns from law abiding citizens. And they gave their entire game away by making clear that neither Congress nor the Supreme Court will stand in the way of their radical mission. Their proposed solutions to the problem of violent crime in this country is to make felons of, out of law-abiding citizens under the age of 21, to make felons of law-abiding citizens who own firearms in homes with children, and to make felons of law-abiding citizens who so own these are all the amendments magazines that hold more than through, 10 rounds of ammunition. Sat through for nine the hours, most common fire in this country. Grab a link to his so, sells 15 round magazines. Their proposed solutions are to force law enforcement officers to ignore due process and to strip law-abiding citizens of the means to protect themselves and their families from threats. And make no mistakes, my Democrat colleagues intend on total infringement on America's Second Amendment rights. Ms. Swearer, before you answer the, the most pertinent question I think that we're going to hear from you in just a second, I want you to tell me, can you define defensive use? Uh, a defensive use, and I'm assuming you mean lawful defensive yes. use, uh, it would be a use of a firearm that is to defend oneself lawfully against criminal actions by another. How often is lawful defensive use of firearms in this country? According to a 2013 report by the CDC, uh, almost all, with very few exceptions, but the most rigorous studies and almost all of them show that- Hi, we're OfferPad, and we want to buy your home. Yeah, Just go I mean, to OfferPad.com, and their basic information. Do you believe that firearm use for self-defense, defense of others, or for the protection of property saves lives? Yes, it objectively saves lives. Now, you were accused by someone who took out of context something you testified of in 2019 of effectively committing a crime and committing perjury before Congress. Would you please like to respond to that? Uh, Congressman, respectfully, and I, I appreciate the opportunity, but we've wasted enough time on political games today, and I'd like to get back to the merits of actually talking about solutions. Very good. Now, I'm going to go forward now, and, and Madam Chair, I'm going to submit She's these, freaking, uh, she the Man? following uh, items for the record. The testimony of Stephen Williford before the Senate Judiciary Committee on May 25, 2021, Mr. Williford is a good guy with a gun who heroically confronted and stopped a mass shooter in Sutherland Springs, Texas. 
I also submit a 2019 study by John Lott of the Crime Research Prevention Center. His study examines data on the rate of shootings and accidents in schools that allow teachers to carry firearms, which found zero cases of someone being wounded or killed from a shooting, let alone a public mass shooting at a school that allows teachers to carry firearms. And thirdly, an, an article by the Washington Examiner that the Buffalo shooter was an eco-socialist racist who hated Fox News and Ben Shapiro with that I yield back. Without objection, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, is now recognized, and we have been called for votes. So, after this, we will recess. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing. And I'd like to thank the witnesses, particularly those on the first panel, for their testimony. I was very moved by what each of them had to say. Americans We've seen an incredible increase in the amount of young men who are ever not intensifying cascade of gun violence afflicting our country. And they are sick and tired of their elected leader continuing to do nothing to address the carnage. The fact of the matter is that the gun lobby led by the NRA and the gun manufacturers that funded exert great influence on politicians to support its policy which is that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. You know, I mean, if, if, if that holds true, then, you know, it just doesn't make sense in a civilized society. And I submit to you that every person with a gun makes us unsafe as opposed to uh, more secure. Um, this every stopping a bad guy with a uh, the good guy with the gun just has not worked to to allow the floodgates to remain open for gun dealers to flood our streets with weapons that are more powerful than what was available last week. Uh, that policy, Madam Chair, has been a failure. So there's you could go watch the actual thing to get the real. Oh, what are we trying to say? Like the actual. Uh, whole testimony. I'm not here to focus on their tired old uh, accusations and assertions. So let's focus on Amy's awesome ability to ninja like answer all their lame questions. I don't know if we listened to this one before. This one, I don't think so. This one is at the two hour and three minute ish. to this committee's investigation into gun trafficking and its recent letters to gun manufacturers. I hope you have the CEOs appear here for testimony because America hears every day from the families who have lost loved ones to gun violence and our country deserves to hear from the CEOs who are profiting off of their loss and pain. Thank you. Thank you and Mrs. Swearer, you are now recognized for your testimony. Mike. We still can't hear you. Turn your mic on. Turn your mic on. Pull it closer to. It's not on. It's not on. Madam Chairwoman. And distinguished members of Congress. My name is Amy Swearer. And I'm a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where my scholarship focuses on the Second Amendment and gun violence prevention. I have testified before various legislatures after several mass shootings, Parkland, Virginia Beach, El Paso, and unfortunately, too many others. No, well, we did listen to that one. It is a good one. Somebody want to timestamp this one? And Virginia. If Congress. Madam so members of Congress. Time. My name is Amy Swearer, and I'm a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where my scholarship focuses on the Second Amendment and gun violence prevention. Pull it closer to. It's not on. It's not on. Not on. I'm going to say 204. And 
distinguished members of Congress. My name is Amy Swearer, and I'm a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where my scholarship focuses on the Second Amendment and gun violence prevention. I have testified before various legislatures after several mass shootings, Parkland, Virginia Beach, El Paso, and unfortunately, too many others. And I hope to God this is the last time I ever have to testify before a legislative body after a mass shooting. I fear that it won't be. And I fear that it won't be because the conversation has become predictable. An unspeakably horrific event like Uvalde or Buffalo happens reflexively, right. almost completely. I'm going to jump back to live and see where they're at. Refuse to even discuss banning assault weapons. You know, my issue here is that we need to reduce the amount of bloodshed on our streets and the damage that these weapons cause will lead to more bloodshed on the streets it's more victims that are being struck and it's um, something that needs to be banned thank you gentleman's, i yield back gentleman's time has expired the gentleman from florida mr donald is recognized for five minutes thank you madam chair and madam chair also thank you for the indulgence before we have to go vote um heard a lot today don't want to do too much speechifying because we do that too often here. Uh, Ms. Ware, it was just, it's been referenced a lot today actually about the need for universal background checks and closing the quote unquote gun show loophole. Can you actually explain in detail what that policy actually means? Sure. So, universal background checks start with this, this general conception of what could be, you know, at its core, legitimate. Um, right now, the only, sorry, most gun sales. Uh, whether it's brick and mortar gun stores, whether it's bought over the internet, anything that occurs interstate, um, those require a background check under existing law. The only exception is for intrastate sales between private sellers, and that is largely because they do not have access to the next system. They cannot, like FFLs, call up the FBI and say, hey, can you run a background check? Um, now, could that theoretically be a way that, that intrastate sale for individuals who are otherwise prohibited to obtain firearms. Sure. As I point out, uh, the problems with HR8 and all of those other bills is that this is a low reward endeavor. This is already not how most criminals are obtaining their firearms. They're already obtaining them through the black market, through informal channels um, that are not in any way, shape, or form addressed by interstate private sales. And on top of that, things like HR8 would criminalize a whole host of responsible temporary low-risk transfers between law-abiding citizens, like if your buddy wants to borrow your hunting rifle, um, or you know, you're know you going on a month-long trip to Europe and you want your guns to be secured in your friend's safe next door, you'd have to go through a background check, legally transfer title of your guns to that individual, and then legally transfer title back to yourself when you're done. Um, right, so, so that's the problem. So Ms. Ware, real quick. So the policy of universal background checks would that have stopped the shooter in Uvalde from acquiring his weapon? It would not have stopped the shooter in Uvalde. Would it have stopped the shooter in Parkland from acquiring his weapon? It would not have stopped, with perhaps one lone exception, a single mass public shooter in the last 20 years. Because they all either passed or were capable of passing background checks. And that's the problem. The shooter the shooter at, uh, in Sandy Hook, the, 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 new, the Newtown shooting, did that shooter kill his mother and take the guns? Yes, he did. And I think... I forget his age, but he otherwise did not have a disqualifying history. The shooter in Uvalde, did he actually shoot his grandmother in the face before he went to perpetrate the crimes in Uvalde? Uh, to my knowledge, yes. Folks, here's the deal. One of the things that we've seen through all these mass shootings, I was a member of the state legislature during the Parkland shooting, so I was in the legislature during that time period. The one thing is crystal clear that these mass shooters that target our schools are all psychopaths. They are psychotic. In Parkland, the red flags were there for everybody to see. The school district did not act. That came out in the Parkland report. The, the, the site itself was not Where secure. That came out in the Parkland report. And you Florida. know the back door was open. Oh, yeah, open, wide open. The, the perpetrator shot his grandmother in the face. That is insane. Um, I know in this bill, the proposed bill uh, today or tomorrow, they're talking about raising the gun, raising the age to buy rifles from 18 to 21. Are we now going to say that a 19 year old who is a legal adult in the United States does not have the mental capacity to own a shotgun or an AR-15, but they have the mental capacity to enlist in the military? They have the mental capacity to actually sign legal contracts. They have taxes. the mental capacity to be treated as an adult by law enforcement. And they also have the mental capacity to vote. 
in the United States, but they don't have the mental capacity to own a shotgun or to own a rifle and not inflict harm on their fellow man. Look, I look, man, I got three sons. Two of them are school age now. When these shootings occur, man, they 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 hurt me because I could only imagine what it is as a parent. I'm a parent. But I also understand that I have a responsibility as a legislator to actually defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution, the Second Amendment is there. It is our responsibility to defend it. And if we look at the data from the mass shootings that have occurred in the United States over the last 20 years, the one constant, especially when it comes to schools, is that these shooters are young, they are mentally disturbed, and the vast majority of people who are in their age group would not even think or go down the pathway of committing these atrocities. We don't pass laws because of the quote unquote one or two psychopaths. We only pass laws in order to maintain the actual legal momentum of freedom in the United States. The Second Amendment is not there to stop psychopaths, let's be perfectly honest with it. It is not. That's not its purpose. The purpose of the Second Amendment is clear. It is to protect the constitutional rights of American citizens. These shootings are awful. They're awful. But the data is clear about how, how to find the people that actually do this. And the measures put in front of us would not have actually stopped these shootings. I yield back. The gentleman time has expired. Votes have been called to allow members to vote. The committee will stand in recess until the end of the first vote series. The committee stands in recess. All right, well, I was outside making me some breaks. I guess it ended. So with that, I'll probably end it also. Did they say how long the recess was going to be? Did anybody hear that? Because I was outside making some rice. Make my rice outside because it's a million degrees outside. So while these uh, arguments and positions are frustrating to hear, they're doing it largely oops, because they have an election year and they think that this is a popular uh, position or uh, topic for whatever. They also think it's one that's a no brainer that no one's going to put much thought into that people are just going to by default assume that guns equal violence and gun owners somehow fetishize violence and conflict. So there's there there require that this all requires a, the, that a, the perception of gun owners is the old perception of gun owners, and that's what they're banking on. And the fact that they're not even wavering from that shows that they're just tone deaf. Is that the way to say it? And uh, their base isn't uh, a bunch of idiots. So the people that they think they're uh, just yelling out and getting a pass for from are being way more critical than they're giving them credit for and what's going to happen is they're going to find out that they're not you know they're going to do their polls they're going to figure out what's going on they're going to lose all this and they'll move on to whatever else they can desperately before election cycle continues so it's a great time to call representatives somebody got some numbers for us let's figure out how to get some numbers you basically go to the internet like this and type in how do I call my sin tour? Oh, I guess my senator would work. So then it, you can go to senate.gov. Senators of the 117th Congress. Right, and then Choose a state, all states. Oh, I guess that didn't work. I thought there's just one number you can call. A capital switchboard operator can also connect you directly with the Senate office. So here we go. So switchboard, op uh, we'll say capital switchboard operator. So there's the website if you want to use the little form there. And then if you want to just call with an old-fashioned telephone and talk to a, probably a person, maybe a switchboard, I don't know. Let's find out. 
good time to call because it takes no time and uh you have to go to one here anymore uh two two four three one two one good time to call a uh, good time to let people know hey you know what this is bs what they're saying here's why and if you want some positions on it the dc projects uh Instagram has some good points. We'll find that here in a second. All right, I'm not going to call him after all, because if it is a person, I don't want to crank call him. So uh, you can call that number, though. Oh, the Patriots saying the switchboard operator can be both for the Senate and the House. Right on. So DC Project is, again, who we're focusing on. The Amy Swear is, uh, I believe, a member of the project and definitely um, the other lady was who testified. What's her name? Thanks for not putting it in the description over here. No, you don't. So this is one of the things I wanted to show you that the uh, DC project put out to offer some suggestions on how to approach different people. Uh, you can definitely send them to their site uh, to check out some of the posts over there to see, just kind of see the kind of things that gun owners are as opposed to what they might be considering gun owners are or what, uh, you know, they're being pigeonholed to. So this is one of the videos that they came out with recently, the first one. Gun control equals tragedy. Why isn't it letting me copy that? Let's just play this one, I guess. They won't mind. My son was shot in the head and killed at a house party with an illegal gun. After he was killed, no one spoke up for weeks. But that's part of the street life. The gun control lobbyist claims their policies will save lives and reduce the <coughs> These policies did not save my son. A crazed drug addict broke into my home, pinned me down on the bed, punched me in my face repeatedly, and then he strangled me. I knew he was going to kill me, and I wondered what my daughter would see when she came home. Then I realized she would be his next victim, and I started fighting for my life. No, I started fighting for her life. I fought to my gun in the dresser. I pointed it straight at him, and he stopped in his tracks. If storage laws required me to lock my gun up, I never would have been able to get to my firearm in time. My son's death was a result of a criminal with an evil heart, a sickening reality of the street life, and the criminal justice system failing to deal with a convicted I've felon taken their that pulled but the I trigger. refuse to stay silent in one of the estimated 2 million lives saved by guns each year. I was and I always will be my own first responder and I will raise my children to be the same for themselves. My name is You Mary and I Gorgeous, are constantly my bombarded by my misinformation. Life. My name is Lucretia Hughes, and I am proud to be a part of the DC Project. What we believe education, not legislation, is how we will save lives. If you survive the tragedy and want to make a difference, share your story with the DC Project. If you are a survivor of a violent attack and you need a community who supports you and your right to protect yourself, please consider joining or supporting the DC Project, Women for Gun Rights, at dcproject.info. I used to think that gun owners love their guns more than their own kids. For many years, I was a strong advocate for gun control until I saw the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. A modern American city was debilitated overnight with looting and violence, and people were scared. 911 was unable to respond. Families were left on their own. I suddenly realized that it was my responsibility to protect my children. The uncertainty of those days is similar to what many communities have recently experienced. Fear, violence, looting, opened the eyes of more than 12 million people who purchased their first firearm in the past two years to protect themselves and their family. As a single mom, I am responsible not only for protecting my daughter, but also for preparing her to be a self-reliant, independent woman. I want her to be able to safely navigate the world with empowerment. I choose to teach my daughter firearm safety and raise her with the mentality that her life is worth defending. 
This is my ultimate goal as a mother. I can't stop criminals from existing, but I can make sure my daughter grows up as prepared as possible for anything she may face. Education is essential to preventing tragedies and abuse of knives, fire, and chemicals available at home. We teach our children how to properly use these tools and the danger they pose. Why aren't we doing the same thing with firearms? For some politicians, it seems easier to push for gun control than focus on firearms education. However, any good parent knows this is not an effective long-term strategy. The DC Project believes we need to utilize educational, anti-bullying, and mental health programs to reduce accidents and curb violence. My son is worth protecting. Vale la pena proteger a mí. My daughter is worth the effort. I'm empowering her with the confidence to become her own first responder. Our children have great futures ahead of them, and thoughts and prayers are not enough. Moms like us value our rights to protect our families. We won't allow our homes to be overrun by criminals and fear. My daughter will be safer because she knows that self-defense is a human right and that she can safely handle firearms. Your kids need to know this too. If you are interested in violence prevention, please consider joining or supporting the DC Project Women for Gun Rights at dcproject.info. So that one was number two, and then this one, I think this was actually number one. That one was, I think I played them in the bad order. I played them in two, three, and now the first one. You and I are constantly bombarded by misinformation from politicians, celebrities, and media personalities who demonize guns and gun owners. Their accounts are contrary to my experience as a responsible gun owner, a retired police officer, and a professional competitive shooter. I have listened to their lies and I've taken their punches, but I refuse to stay silent any longer because I know a lot of women who have something to say and they won in the game. They're ready to play offense with the truth. The truth is we all want the same thing, to protect ourselves, our families, and to be safe in our communities. The DC Project is a nationwide grassroots organization made up of women from every demographic. We come from all different walks of life, but we are united in preserving our Second Amendment rights. As we share our experiences, we push back against gun control lies and oppose those who demand our rights be restricted. As an immigrant from Venezuela, I saw how easy it was for freedom to die. My family and I watched tyranny destroy our home. In Venezuela, the media, celebrities, and politicians repeated the same anti-gun messages until people found it normal and acceptable to give up their freedoms. The reality is none of it is normal or acceptable. Hungry and helpless, Venezuelans are now unable to protect themselves. Now, as a proud American, I am determined to guard against the same things happening here. We constantly hear about common sense gun control, like universal background checks, banning assault weapons, ghost guns, high capacity magazines, and gun show loopholes. Every city that is facing massive crime waves have put these policies into place. Common sense tells me that they don't work. So why do people still believe the idea that those policies save lives? Actual common sense is holding criminals accountable not letting them out of jail or encouraging them to be more confrontational. Common sense is not stealing the right of the American people to protect themselves. This is the message that America needs to hear. The DC Project works to reduce firearm accidents by campaigning for education in schools. We counter the false gun control lies by testifying in hearings and meeting our legislators. We equip our friends, our families, and our communities to know the truth. Gun owners are good people. America is a beacon of freedom. The Second Amendment is a vital piece in ensuring that our kids can have a free country to grow up in. We stand with the lawmakers who support the Constitution and we provide armor from the attacks by the gun control lobby. Join the DC Project today. Become a member, donate, or subscribe to our newsletter for updates on how we educate, advocate, and preserve our Second Amendment rights for generations to come. There you go. So there's a couple of three videos that they've recently, and then 
since we've got everybody here, we'll just go ahead and then I put the Orchids Matter one in there. I don't think I put this one in yet. So there's the link to the, I think it went, we're on the offense now, Our Kids Matter, and then Gun Control Equals Tragedy. No. Yeah. No, no. Our Kids Matter was the last one. So it was, we're on the offense now. It was the first one. Gun Control Equals Tragedy, and then Our Kids Matter. So check those out. Check out their Instagram. Here's their Instagram for examples and some actual suggestions for uh, having a conversation. We put the link into the Capitol switchboard that gets you both to the House and Senate. Great time to exercise the, what's the word, citizenry? What's the word, uh, civic uh, opportunity that we have as People who live here now we're still looking at the pbs stream which is linked in the description if you want to watch the whole thing it looks like it's still streaming and it's at about well, going on four hours uh, i became aware of this from a post over on instagram from cape gunworks who's a gun shop in massachusetts sits and they're pretty cool and i would imagine sometime today they'll be going live Barbecue will be going live here in a bit. Uh, let's see. Can't find where he's got his upcoming. I think it's actually coming up here sooner than later. I'm going to get this thing to go smaller. No, I don't know how to make it go smaller now that I made it giant. So anyway, uh, I don't know if anything else is showing this. So I am going to, is anybody even out here anymore? I'm going to go back to, it looks like about the, this mark here. And we're going to listen to her little testimony from the DC project, which is why we started this whole thing. I saw a post earlier on Instagram from Cape Gunworks. Oh, do I have to hit play? Okay, I'm gonna pause it again. I think it's 309. Is that right? What happened? Well, barbecue's going live. So we're going to uh, play. Uh, uh, increase. I don't know how to space your name. So I'm just going to say at the 3.09. There. to address the violence in our country. My name is Lucretia Hughes Klukin. I have four children and nine grandchildren. On the night of April the 2nd, 2016, my family got a phone call that would change our lives forever. My ex-husband answered the phone and let out a blood curdling scream, a scream of pain from the depths of his soul. He screamed, he cried, he's gone, he is gone. Our 19-year-old son, Emmanuel, went to a party early that night. After we got the call, we was frantic. We called his phone. No one answered. We called even the police. I went to Facebook, and I had to ask, is my son dead? I found out that he was shot point blank in the head and killed while playing dominoes. No one spoke up for weeks, and the killer was on the run. No one was going to snitch, but that is the street life. 
Words can't describe how hard it is to bury a child. I ache for anyone and all who have done the same. My son's death was a result of a criminal with an evil heart and a justice system failing to hold him accountable for the laws he had already broken. You see, a convicted felon killed my son with an illegally obtained gun. Our gun control lobbyists and politicians claim that their policies will save lives and reduce violence. Well, those policies did not save my son. The laws being discussed are already implemented in cities across this country. We have decades of evidence proving they do not work. St. Louis, New York, Chicago, Washington, Atlanta are gun control utopias and they are plagued with the most violence. 10 more laws, 20 more laws, a thousand more won't make what has already illegal more wrong or stop criminals from committing these crimes. And y'all are delusional if you think it's gonna keep us safe. I am a walking testimony of how the criminal justice system and the gun control laws, which is steeped in racism, by the way, have failed the black community. By the age of 25, I had already went to 18 young black men funeral at the age of 25. I have one black man in jail, one black man in the grave, and my young grandson gonna be raised without a father. And it's a curse on the black community and everyone else's. Something has to change. Thoughts and prayers and calls for more gun control isn't enough. How about letting me defend myself from evil? I, you don't think that I'm capable and trustworthy to handle a firearm. You don't think that the second amendment doesn't apply to people that look like me? Who and you who would call for more gun controls are the same ones that are calling to defund the police. Who is supposed to protect us? We must prepare to be our own first responders to protect ourselves and our loved ones. I am a legal, law-abiding citizen, and I don't need the government to save me. I teach people how to use a firearm. I empower others to look at me to understand the Second Amendment is their right. I am a proud member of the DC Project, Women for Gun Rights. We believe that education is the key to safety, not ineffective legislation. We support meaningful solutions that will actually save lives. We support the Safe Student Act, HR 7415, which would immediately make schools safer. In hindsight of Parkland, we saw failure of the government at every level failing the students. <laughs> students saw something and they said something and the school did not act. Police were called to his residence over 30 times and they did not act. And finally, the police did not go into their school that fateful day and failed to protect those kids. We need to secure our secure our schools and we got to secure this building or like y'all do. What's the difference? We call on Congress to ban gun free zones, fund nonpartisan firearm education programs like Kids Safe Foundation and non-governmental mental health organizations like Hold Welcome My Guns. And in closing, I claim that nothing in these bills 
do anything to make us safer or address the mental health crisis in this country. Despite living with the heartache of losing my son on a daily basis, I believe it is our God-given right to defend ourselves from any act of violence, making it more difficult or even more expensive for me and people that look like me and other law-abiding citizens will not make us safer. It will embolden the criminals. Gun owners are not the enemies in these gun control policies are not the solution. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you all for your powerful, and meaningful and gut-wrenching testimony. Uh, we will now pause and you are excused.